conversations that we've been able to have over the last few days. Um, this paper really starts with my enthusiasm about a brilliant Australian novel I've read, uh, Carpentaria, that I wish everyone could read. And it's prompted a series of uh, questions that I'm still uh, working through myself. So what would it mean for Canadian scholarship to shift its gaze from transatlantic imaginaries toward the trans-Pacific? What would it mean for post-colonial studies in Canada to follow local indigenous initiatives of building connections across the Pacific with Maori and Australian indigenous counterparts? The recent scholarly turn in many disciplines from continental to trans-oceanic imaginaries is sparking a new set of questions about the frameworks through which knowledge is produced. So my paper takes up James Clifford's reminder that in his words, native Pacific conditions are importantly different from those generating North Atlantic cultural studies. If Black Atlantic and South Asian diaspora theory is to travel well in the Pacific, there needs to be a significant adaptation to a different map and history. So I'm wondering what might that different map and history look like if approached from Canadian locations reading across the Pacific. Um, and these questions have prompted me to revisit the subfield through which I first approached Canadian literature that of comparative Australian-Canadian studies. And that field flourished throughout the 1980s, but gradually diminished as race and identity-based post-colonial studies successfully argued that settler colonial studies had no place within post-colonial, theoretical, or literary study. And as nation-based studies addressing multiculturalism within the nation state assumed priority. But now, at the turn of a new century, Indigenous studies are leading a revival of interest in the particular dynamics and institutional structures of invader settler colonies around the world. And even official post-colonial studies is belatedly recognizing the importance of indigenous perspectives. And I'm, um, I'm thinking here of a recent article by Robert Young that uh, recently belatedly acknowledged this field. So part of this turn toward indigenous imaginaries involves a revival of interest in the literature and knowledge systems produced by indigenous peoples globally. That revival of interest in turn is leading to questions about how to write and read across cultural differences and how we ought to read across such differences. So these questions about meaning making emerge in the context of sovereignty claims which remain to be resolved. Um, and one interesting initiative a colleague of mine is involved in, uh, she works in Indigenous governance, and they're unhappy with the Eurocentric implications of sovereignty as a, a word and a concept, and they're turning back to Indigenous languages to look for um, words more appropriate to their understanding of uh, self-government. So I'm arguing that the literacy required to read aesthetic and sovereignty claims together requires new forms of attention to difference. Norms of understanding that make sense within imperialist imaginaries and their nationalist descendants are being challenged by indigenous fictions that cast old questions in a new light. So in this paper, I'm starting to navigate some of these questions, thinking about uh, Cree, uh, Thompson Highway's Kiss of the Fur Queen, a novel I assume most of you know. Uh, in relation to Australian Wanye writer Alexis Wright's Carpentaria, a novel I know only a few of you have read. Uh, so these fictions, both of them, problematize Western assumptions about time-space relations, expression, and representation and claims to knowledge, expertise, and authority through pluralizing modes of knowing and belief. Um, so I'm only just going to touch on these today. Uh, we've heard throughout this conference about various modes of site-specific production of time-space relations. And as my contribution, I'm turning back to the idea of the chronotope. Um, to signal different, that different map in history to which uh, Clif <coughs> Clifford alludes. 
Bakhtin describes how the chronotope operates as a formally constituted category of literature. The place where the knots of narrative are tied and untied, and where time with a capital T becomes palpable and visible. For Peter Hitchcock, uh, an inspired reader of Bakhtin in post-colonial context, chronotope is not any old coordinate of time and space, but that figural semantic process allowing narrative to proceed to form. And I'm, I'm continuing to quote Hitchcock here, in every space of post-coloniality marked by nation or locale, movement or embeddedness, inscription or orality, culture refracts duration. Not just that colonialism was endured, but that its figures of time did not absolutely displace or dismantle local forms of temporality. So in his book, The Long Space, Hitchcock sets himself the challenge of taking chronotope as a constitutive problem of transnational narration, a knot that is a key to the ways through which postcoloniality can be expressed. And he does this in order to intervene in current debates about world literature, postcoloniality, and narrative form. So my goal is more modest, um, but I'm inspired by his argument that transnationalism of this kind seeks to link writers beyond a spatial and epistemological divide, not because their histories are the same, but because they speak to a logic of time that remains dissatisfied with posts or eras or linearity, or representing at best through sociological, anthropological content. So I'm arguing that Highway and Kiss of the Fur Queen and Wright and Carpentaria speak to alternative logics of time-space that work through chronotopes that are formally transformative in this way. And it's Carpentaria that's led me to revisit and rethink what's happening in Kiss of the Fur Queen uh, and to place even more importance on its second epigraph, the powerful statement made by Chief Seattle of the Squamish that the dead are not powerless. Um, so there's many moments uh, in Kiss of the Fur Queen that point to the truth of that statement. Um, I just refer to one when the brothers Okamasis return home from residential school. You'll remember they hear a lone wolf's howl touching off a vague shutter that shudder that brushed the surface of their hearts in perfect unison like the ice-cold hand of someone waking after 500 years of sleep. And I used to read that like as signaling a uh, simile, but now I read it more literally. Uh, this is the island where Father Thibodeau's men caught Chachagatu, a woman they're told was evil because she held a frightening dream power. And as the narrative progresses, she becomes linked in Gabriel's mind to the winking white fox who appears at key moments to throw the text realism slightly off balance. And as they learn more about her defiance of the church, their interest in her grows. So through her power that transcends the grave, Chachagatu testifies to other modes of knowing, forms of authority alternative to the church and the school, and an alternative logic of time. So Carpentaria's narrative also repeatedly shows that the dead can intervene in the lives of the living. Um, among other moments, there's a very powerful scene where the ancestors intervene to help Normal Phantom, uh, one of the central characters of the book, save his grandson, Bala. And there's another incredible moment where there's a rock which has been waiting centuries for this moment, trips up the evil mind's employees as they pursue the mind's opponent, Normal's estranged son, Will Phantom. So at these moments, time becomes palpable and visible and narrative knots are tied and untied. Wright explains the temporal logic behind the telling of her text. The idea struck me that if I were to tell a story to our people, I would also be telling a story to our ancestors. 
So that expanded sense of audience transcending time necessitated a story in her words that was written like a long song following the ancient tradition, reaching back as much as it reached forward to tell a contemporary story to our ground. So those simple lines issue a challenge to Western assumptions about audience, ground, time, progress, narrative, and value. And all of this starts with the title of Carpentaria's chapter one, From Time Immemorial. So this takes me to section three on song. Carpentaria writes, or more correctly sings, against the situation described in its opening lines. Uh, described in capital letters. A nation chants, but we know your story already. So then the story that follows tells an alternative knowing, reframing the Australian nationalist story in terms of songs sung in recognition of an indigenous imaginary. So in describing the task she sets herself, Wright asks a question that's more complicated than it seems at first reading. What songs should be sung in recognition of our national collectivity? So the potential ambiguity in such a question, which national collectivity, continues to haunt invader settler societies in very particular ways, even as it assumes importance for most collectivities in global times. And a similar question challenges the Okamasis brothers in KISS as they explore Western art and their Cree traditions for narrative forms and an adequate language that can do justice to their mixed experience. The brothers' quest mirrors highways in writing KISS. And Judith Butler and Gayatri Spivak's book, Who Sings the Nation State, provides another revealing frame for thinking about what it means in different parts of the world to sing a national collectivity which is not necessarily congruent with a nation state. Butler begins her dialogue with Spivak by asking, what are literary scholars doing with global states? And that's a question that points to the changing mandate of literary studies in global times. Global states, with a deliberate pun on the double meaning of state, are part of the context out of which texts arise today and through which they circulate. So Carpentry and Kiss resonate in different ways for the different audiences they reach, and the two epigraphs to Highway's novel set up a tension between the edict of the state forbidding dancing to a particular community at a particular time in history, and the claim of Chief Seattle to an alternative understanding of community which can defy that edict beyond the grave. So music, dance, and theater shape Highway's story, um, I think in the interest of time, I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip uh, some of the ways in which they gradually learn about Chattagatu's um, importance um, to their lives. Um, she died as the last shaman in their part of the world, but her power lives on. And eventually they reclaim her centrality to their cultural view in their projection Chattagatu, the shaman, described in the text as a show so controversial that the Cardinal of Toronto had snuck into the show dressed as a Rosedale matron. So Indian rumor rabidly insisted um, that we're told very little else about uh, this particular show. But this successful production coincides with Gabriel's death, which is described as a race across the tundra in a repetition of his father's winning race with which the book began. And in his death on the closing night of the play, Gabriel assumes the role of the caribou hunter racing to meet his fate in the person of the trickster fur queen. And I'm wondering what we're to make of this juxtaposition. It's my impression that Chattagatu's shamanic role in Kiss and that of the windswept tundra have been overshadowed in much of the critical response to this book by readerly pleasure in its trickster dynamics and that the father's hunter's knowledge has been overshadowed by the theatrical artistic uh, work of his sons. Um, so the skills of the caribou hunter 
have been downplayed in favor of those inherited by his sons. And it was Carpentaria's description of normal phantom as a scholar of the sea that caused me to look again at Abraham Okameza's way of knowing. For each father navigates a forbidding northern landscape with absolute confidence and love. Uh, which takes me to ways of knowing, section four. Each novel reframes how meanings get made, renaming potentialities and imagining possible futures beyond Eurocentric imaginaries. Carpinteria explains that its story takes place on traditional lands taken but never ceded. So taken but never ceded, that forms the basis of today's sovereignty claims. Um, as Eileen Morton Robinson explains, indigenous sovereignty has never been ceded, but this is denied by Australian law. Morton Robinson's introduction to her book, Sovereignty Matters, describes the logic enacted within Carpentaria. And these are her words. Our sovereignty is embodied. It is ontological, our being, and epistemological, our way of knowing. And it is grounded within complex relations derived from the intersubstantiation of ancestral beings, human and land. In this sense, our sovereignty is carried by the body and differs from Western constructions of sovereignty, which are predicated on the social contract model, the idea of a unified supreme authority, territorial integrity, and individual rights." End of quote. So those Western predications place humans at the center of the universe in ways that Australian indigenous ontologies do not. And so while treaties were signed in Canada, KISS, I think, presents a similar view of indigenous sovereignty and the threat of mining economies to the land, the ways in which colonization is a living process and a living process that's difficult to exercise. So the fragments of conversation that the brothers hear at the ballet resonate with more ominous notes of threat when they're read alongside Carpentaria's more overt opposition to mines in the Australian North. The boys hear snatches of words, northern Manitoba, ripe for the plucking, uninhabited, or might as well be. The vision that follows seduces the boys with its comical extravagance of a wealth from the land that made Cree Indians so wealthy they could commute to Las Vegas for blackjack every weekend. But in the context of the novel as a whole, those dreams on fire are seen as both unrealistic and corrupting. And facing death, the brothers return to the land as they first remember it. So I think the current fascination with trauma narratives and memory can often seem a backward-looking obsession, preventing engagement and shaping alternatives in the present, especially when that fascination is seen in terms of a linear narrative in which time moves in only one direction. Carpentaria interrupts that narrative early on when its narrator claims, and I quote, if you are someone who visits old cemeteries, Wait a while if you visit the water people, the old Gulf country men and women who took our besieged memories to the grave might just climb out of the mud and tell you the real story of what happened here. And that's exactly what Chachagathadu does in Kiss once the brothers have learned to hear her story. So Wright concludes her essay, Where to Point the Spears, by suggesting, I think I've been able to reach a point where I can imagine a world from the hill that is within, as I believe was once said by Nietzsche. It's not all scorched earth of the mind. <coughs> and I think Highway's novel has been generally received as a redemptive text, yet reading right reminds me of the many ways in which his text continues to testify to how much scorched earth in the mind remains. Wright expresses faith that it is possible to imagine difference, and it is possible to live the opposite of being shackled. 
Carpentaria performs these possibilities of freedom through recreating a knowledge that remaps the landscape according to indigenous understandings. And this is a world that overflows Western systems of mapping, remaking the world through tornado and flood, just as Wright remakes it through the remarkable diversity of linguistic registers in her book. So uh, the white coastal town is obliterated um, you don't know if it's at the end of the book or the beginning of the story. <laughs> um, but this waterfront, this particular waterfront, um, exists only in flux as the tropical landscape is always changing. So how can we read uh, Wright's imaginary that overfla overflows most of the maps provided um, by the, the labels we have as literary critics. There's, there's quite a debate about how to understand this book. Uh, some people want to sort of slot it into magic realism. Other people want to insist that it's totally incommensurable, so white people will never be able to understand it. Um, no one's talked about uh, Dimmick's uh, globally scaled universalisms invoking deep time yet in relation to this book, but it's another possible um, another possible mode. Uh, you remember Weichi Dimmock argues that literature is the home of non-standard space and time. Um, and she opposes literature to the fixed intervals of the clock. Um, she questions the analytic adequacy of the sovereign state, linking it to the rise of modernity and the rule of the uh, mechanical clock. And I think there's, there's, there's comical moments in um, Carpentaria that make fun of clock time and the assumptions of normalcy and normality um, attached to living your life according to their uh, rules. But I would caution against um, assimilating Carpentaria's chronotopes into this kind of broader universalized imaginary that is now being embraced by canonical comparative literature uh, through newly discovered affinities with geological time. And I think the danger with this global scale um, lies in its erasure of the alliance that the book sets up between this expansive long view and the sovereignty politics of this time and place, a particularity underlined by the novel's title, which locates its voice as emergent from and unique to the Gulf region called Carpentaria. Um, so I'm going to skip some more of these debates as time goes on. Linear time. Uh, as linear time. As, uh, my life is totally, my life is totally ruled by clock time. Um, but Wright insists that in writing Carpentaria, she was not bowing to an expectation that she can only look through the glare of the narrow prism of colonialism to infinity. Carpentaria was to be a work of art derived from the full complexity of the contemporary indigenous world not suited to a tourist reader, but rather written to question the idea of boundaries through exploring how ancient beliefs sit in the modern world, while at the same time exposing the fragility of the boundaries of indigenous home places of the mind by exposing how those places are constantly under stress and burdened with threat. She wanted, she said, her reader to believe in the energy of the Gulf country to stay with a story as a welcome stranger, as if the land was telling a story about itself as much as a narrator telling stories to the land. So I'm suggesting that to read Kiss in such a light is to see the northern landscapes of the brother's childhood and their father's expertise as a hunter as more central to the novel's vision and its ethical grounding than they might have seemed to readers concerned primarily with the residential school experience and the contemporary plight of urban natives. So episodes such as Champion's birth and his singing to the rampaging caribou herd assume new power when conceived as the land telling a story about itself.
and that reciprocal exchange between Land and Singer. So Linda Chua Smith begins her now classic study, Decolonizing Methodologies, Research in Indigenous Peoples, by stressing the constant interchange between the scholarly and the imaginative. So I've tried to model a bit of that process in this paper here. When Spivak suggests the planetarity she seeks is best imagined from the pre-capitalist cultures of this planet, she hypothesizes an outside to the current impasses to which contemporary capitalism has led our world. Carpentaria and Kiss each write out of the collision of pre-capitalist and capitalist imaginaries with novels that strain and stretch understanding. Kiss ends with a wink and Carpentaria with the allegorically named Will Phantom searching for his lost wife, Hope. What we make of these moments depends uh, on us. Each novel implicates its readers in the politics of reading. So reading Kiss through Carpentaria sharpens my understanding of the centrality of the North and its chronotopes that speak to an alternative view of time, the land, and human possibility in ways that question the privileging of urban imaginaries and the chronotopes that they generate. So thanks for listening.